Hi. Hey. We have exciting things to talk about. We can't wait to tell you. We We have a live show. Oh my God. We're going to be together. We're going to have a live show. It's a digital experience via Moment House. It's on July 21st at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. We're going to be together. The theme is TGOG Summer Camp. So we're getting a little spooky. Spooky. Grab your summer bags. Your s'mores. Um, I don't know, your favorite horror movies that take place at camps and sleepaway camp and um, get ready to be terrified because we are going to tell amazing spooky stories about the outdoors and camping and put us all in the mood and be terrified to go outside all summer because that's what we do here. Perfectly in sync with what we do. (laughs) Exactly. There's going to be exclusive merch that you can purchase. There's going to be meet and greets. And just generally an awesome time. So we cannot wait. And we cannot wait for you you to be there there. with us. Yes. We will see you there. Oh. Oh. Hi, Lay. That's a (laughs) kitty booty in the screen. Get your tickets now on our website or on momenthouse.com. And we'll see you there. We'll get it one day. <laughs> I'm still new at YouTube. I You're did like premier. your greetings, Earthlings. Greetings, nice. Earthlings. Well, I'm greetings. kind of in the mood because did you see the trailer for Hocus Pocus 2 came out? <gasps> no. So I'm all like, children. Oh my gosh. Feeling the vibes, feeling all Hocus Pocus y. Okay, I have not seen it. Sisters. It's Immediately good. after we record, I am going to go watch it. I can't yeah, wait. Yeah, I think it came out today, so you're not late. I saw it like two Okay, when does ago. the movie come sent out? It to you. September 30th. Should we do a screening on our Patreon? Like we a, should. We should. We watch it I together. It, I think it might be dire- – yeah, I think it's streaming September 30th, so I don't know what that means. Does that mean that it's not going to theaters? It's just going straight to – I think so. I don't really know. But we should all watch it together. That's also my I mom's birthday. Love that. Oh, so what a perfect birthday present to watch. I know. Hocus Happy Pocus birthday to, to me <laughs> with all the phantoms. It'll be great. Okay, Leia is about to do something very naughty. Naughty girl, naughty girl. Don't well, do it. Uh, this is an episode of Two Girls One Ghost. Yes. Two girls, one ghost, and we are your ghostesses. That is Corinne. Hi. And I am Sabrina. And okay, we have a lot of exciting things to talk about. First of all, mm-hmm. we have a live show with Moment House on July 21st. And we have new merch that is going to be sold. Yes. That's so and also, cute. Look at it. It's a bucket hat with a ghost. Also, I'm realizing just how much smaller the circumference of your head is because that like really – you have room in there. And I, do I know – I'm waiting for mine to come in, but I, my fe- – bucket hats, they're tight. I really have to like – my head is huge. I have like a size large men's – I've said this before. Size I know. Size large men's head. It's amazing. <laughs> it's because your brain is so big. No, no. There's just a lot of fluid just floating around. <laughs> it's because – no, it's because you have so much paranormal um, abilities. Knowledge. Oh, And that part of your brain is just, yeah, you have to tap into it. Okay. I'm going to try because that's, you know what? I say this all the time that I really want to like tap in and practice and whatnot. And I've decided that I actually am going to start. I have like a date ready for myself and it's next week that I'm going to try every single day for five minutes. I'm going to light a candle and then I'm going to blow out the the wick and then I'm going to try really hard to focus in on the smoke and make it go straight. You know how people do that to see if they can control it. So I'm going to practice that every single day for five minutes. That's my that's wow. I'm weave back into the world of. Should we do it together? Yeah, we should. 
Okay, so what do you do? You just have to like concentrate on it, like close your eyes? I think and- – I don't even think you have to close your eyes. I think you just look oh. at it and you just concentrate really hard on trying to manipulate the smoke and have it go – Straight up. Straight. Okay, I should we not- try it next recording? Should we at the beginning of every episode try it and we'll just track then, our progress? In silence – I feel like it's it's too much time of a gap of us not talking. But I think okay, once well, we, we can, master it, we can start <laughs> and we'll blow out the candle and then the beginning, the smoke will go straight. Okay. Well, or we can cut it out of our audio portion. And if people want to see how we're doing, we leave it in just in the video version. That's that's a good idea. Oh, oh or we could do a TikTok where it's like, because <gasps> you know how you can respond to yeah. your old video. So we can just do like every day our progress. On the smoke thing. And then let's hope it doesn't take us like 300 days and 300 oh my gosh. videos. People are like, okay, we'll we get it. You guys are not powerful witches. Get out of here. We try like once a week progress. Don't want to. Okay. That's a good idea. Yeah. We'll see. I wish you could like, this is so dumb. No, it's not. It'd be really cool. I wish you could, if I mastered astral projection, I wish mm. I could record my experiences. Oh, like while you're astral projecting? Yeah. Okay. This is back to 1% history with Two Girls, One Ghost. <laughs> I heard somewhere that we were getting closer to recording our dreams <gasps> oh. and that there was some like serious progress made on the ability to record dreams. However, okay, I heard this on TikTok scrolling at like mm. 1130 p.m. Is it true? Is it not? I don't know. I heard it. Did absolutely zero research past <laughs> someone on the internet just telling me yes. that that was happening. Yes. And that is why this is 1% history and fact and not 100% truth. No. Right. No. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So do you know I don't what know, you come but that here would be for? Cool. It's not facts. Ugh. Honestly, Two I girls, feel like that one would be brain cell. That's who we are. <laughs> Two girls, one brain cell. I do think that if we were able to record dreams – I wonder what they would look like. I wonder if they're as interesting as we think they are or like astral projection. Mm -hmm. And if they are really interesting, would that be sort of like the death of television and movies? Would everyone just want to watch people's like real life recorded dreams, recorded movies? It's like real but fake, but also real. Because what if it's just when you dream, you slip into alternate universe you? So that's that's my idea for a movie that I will eventually write one yes. day. Um my uh Are I you can't okay? remember what I was <laughs> You know, I, it's because your brain is too big. Sometimes <laughs> the thoughts disappear. <laughs> they get lost in there. <laughs> no, you wanna know what it is? My <laughs> recall abilities, my recall skills have gone yeah. down the trash shoot like it's it's so far gone i used to be able to be like oh this television show this celebrity this movie and now i know what i'm talking about but i don't know what it's called ever and so i was having a moment where i wanted to bring something up and then i realized i didn't remember the name of it and i was like we can't have yet another episode where i go what is the thing where i was like forget it i'll remember and we'll talk about it next week (laughs) and yeah or you'll remember in the middle of like me telling a story and you'll be oh and you can interrupt me and tell me yes Yeah, but I did start. I'm so late to the game. I did start, and now I'm forgetting the because my recall sucks. Oh no! But the show where it's the church and the demons and the oh 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 oh, oh, the angels. Oh Oh. (laughs) my gosh! It's the same guy as Bly Manor. Why am I forgetting it? I literally have watched it. I watched it last night. Oh gosh, we've talked about it so much. This is so annoying. Why do we do um, it? Why does this happen to us? I don't know. This oh, needs um, to like basically be it's cut like out. It's like on the tip of my tongue. It is Midnight Mass. The Midnight Mass. Midnight, midnight Mass. mass. Yes, 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 yes. You know, I need to play okay. some brain games. I know. Truly. I think Sudoku is supposed to be really good for your brain. I'm – It's. yeah, I am really concerned. I have such bad memory and I've also recently been having this thing where – I truly don't know the difference between my dreams and my reality. The other day I had to ask Nick, yes. like, did this happen in real life or was this a dream? Because it was – I like recall it as if it happened in real life, but it didn't. So it was a dream. 
but that's scary. Right. I was just having this conversation the other day with Brian because now I'm remembering. Here's my recall finally coming back. It wasn't the middle of the episode, but it's right now. We are watching the new <laughs> Here Marvel, it is. the new Mar- Marvel movie with Doctor Strange uh-huh. and uh, like Elizabeth Isn't Olsen who plays the Scarlet Doctor Witch. Strange? It, it's Doctor Strange something 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 mm. like one of the many Doc, Doctor yeah, Strange yeah. movies because we're in his time period right now with the next series of movies. So yes. I think he's in like pretty much all of them um but they were talking about like other universe you and it was like oh that sucks for other universe you because basically you can slip into all of these other dimensions of all these other timelines and we were talking about it in our dreams brian had a nightmare and i had a nightmare and we we're like it was right after we'd watched the movie and we we're like man that really sucks for other universe me or <laughs> other universe like this person that something horrible happened to yeah. in our dreams because they are so real it feels so real and then you start thinking like well is this something are we seeing a glimpse into another into timeline? some reality yeah i i, I fully I'm starting to really believe that. it i do yeah me too i mean but then it's like how many of how many alternate us's are there? Because I don't know. It's just like one of those things where it's like, if you're having a dream about one thing that feels so close to your reality, it could just be a slightly skewed different universe. But then if you have something that's so drastically different than what your reality is, is that a different universe or is it the same? How many are there? Well, maybe it's one of those things where we're like, oh, well, I knew it was a dream because then this weird thing happened. And it's because it's different than our universe. It's like, yeah. I knew it was a dream because then there were like dinosaurs walking outside and that's not real today. I mean, except chickens and crocodiles and stuff and birds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like except we do T-Rexes. But <laughs> yeah, the T-Rexes. But oh my God, wait. ADHD going off course <laughs> there there is I haven't been able to watch it because it's on a streaming service that I don't have okay. but there is a new show all about dinosaurs and incorporating all the new knowledge that we have of dinosaurs and it's believed what? that T-Rex well one of the theories is that the T-Rex you know how they have the little arms a little and they're yeah. generally I like big use- head on little hands <laughs> yeah Good old Toy Story. Uh, so, of course, one of the theories that we heard more Isn't recently that in the past me? couple of years. Um, I don't know. I thought okay. it was. I thought it was Toy Story, but no, we could be wrong. I like how we we're just like fully <laughs> holding our like little chicken arm, T Rex arms, until we finish this. But a few <laughs> years ago, there was the theory that these little arms were for wings and that they actually had these oh. giant feathered wings and that t-rex were covered in feathers but a new theory is that they were actually these colorful little arms that were used for male t-rex to do a little like dance and display for the female so they like shut up it's like birds. Little colorful arms they show their like, colors la, 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 la. yeah and they do like a silly little dance <laughs> it's so cute i mean i, I know t-rex are terrifying but that i was love like, that it is very cute it is very cute interesting huh yeah so dinosaurs. we don't have dinosaurs maybe here. they exist maybe, in another universe maybe, yeah i They're mean we're around. trying to bring back woolly mammoths apparently if you didn't hear that news which actually i wasn't well, i already ex- they already exist have you seen me when i haven't shaved <laughs> i was thinking about you earlier because i was really letting my armpit hair grow and i was like i gotta <laughs> wax it i like that and that's how like, <laughs> why you think of me <laughs> Okay. Good <laughs> reputation for me to have. Good reputation. Oh, so funny. Oh my god. So tell I'm me dying. about Sabrina. Oh, well, she has very hairy a whole body. Her everything. She's hairy. Uh, well, Lots you know hair. what? Hairy girls, we're okay. We, we can unite. Be, we gotta Yeah, we do unite. Uh Hairy Girl unite. Summer. Bring it back. Hairy girls. Well, or bring it back. It never was, right. I guess maybe the seventies. No, there were times. It, it yeah. still is a thing. It's it's our culture telling us that we need to get rid of our hair. And we don't need and, to. Yep. And we don't. In fact, I very rarely do. <laughs> Same. It's a lot of effort. It is. Ugh. It is. I don't. But the the once a week shave that I do do feels great. So it's fine. Everything's fine. Like, yeah. This yeah. is fine. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. The theme this week 
is old timey ghosts. And it was picked by yes. a Patreon donor. Yes. Old timey ghosts slash mm-hmm. skeptics. We're kind of like two suggestions in one. So yes. I incorporated them both in mine, but we could basically go one way or the other. So we had yeah, a, wait, we who had, was it that who picked this topic? Oh, let me tell you. Okay. I think I can find it too. Let's see who it gets was, there first. It was Kate. Kate oh, you got there suggested first. Suggested this. Yes. That was a pre oops. That was a previous benefit of our old Patreon was to yes. pick out a suggestion. But also sometimes people just suggest things to us anyway and we try and to we get excited. credit credit due yeah. where where give credit where it's due. Holy shit. <laughs> two girls it's one your brain, brain that's coming too back. Big. <laughs> it's too big. No, it's too stupid It's too big. There are too right many now. thoughts that you can't speak because there's just so just, much going on. Yeah. It's just All right, overwhelming. Who else has too big of a brain? Right All of us. Uh, okay. You, so, because you're filled with knowledge for what you're about to tell us. I do. I am. And I will forget it. <laughs> I do. It. I am. I will forget it by next week. But I'm excited to share it now. Okay. So <laughs> I went with the old timey theme and mm-hmm. I was – trying to figure out one of the things that I love about this is the we'll get a topic but then finding what we're going to research takes a long time so I was like okay what in old-timey ghosts do I want to talk about and I was like oh there's so many cool old-timey Victorian era stories but when I was googling Victorian era era ghost stories it was all all the like old-timey fake or like written ghost Uh, stories because that was such a big thing back then yeah and I was just like trying so hard to figure out how to like specifically keyword search for this. And then I was like, oh, okay, the UK is really old and there's so much history there. So I searched what I did. I did most haunted places in the UK. That's what I ended up searching. Lovely. And then because of that, I found so many possibilities that I like started filling out future episodes in our Excel. Oh, good. Which is always, I'm setting my future self up for success. Right. That's a good cheat sheet. I also feel like – yeah. <clears throat> sorry, my voice is like really struggling the past month. I feel like this is one of your favorite things. I feel like you gravitate a lot to like Victorian era – Yes. Like ladies in white, children, mm-hmm. demons, like good old nightgowns. I feel like this is the time yes. that you would like to see most if we could time travel. Yes. And I do think in an alternate universe, I am – permanently wearing Victorian nightgowns and that's just my style <laughs> with like just combat the nightgowns boots. I don't want to wear any of the other Victorian clothing I mean I do for like a second for a costume party yeah but not yeah. every day I'm tr- I can yeah. barely breathe in my sweatpants let's be real oh there's yeah. a lot of I don't want to be restricted I'm like pulling them up to literally to the bottom of my boobs right now <laughs> oh oh I love sweatpants Keep the, the belly best thing there. honestly the best thing that came out of the pandemic was the really cute matching sweatpants, sweat, sweatshirt sets. Sweatshirt sets. Love them. Love them. Okay. So for today, for old timey ghosts, I decided to talk about Aston Hall. It's a stunning and like really, we should look up photos. If you have a second cringe, you should look up a photo. Okay. It is I'm a going beautiful, to. beautiful red brick Renaissance Jacobian style house. It's like a manor. It's not a house. Let's be honest. Um, in Birmingham, Birmingham, England. And it actually, when I saw a picture of it, it looked, it reminded me so much of Button House, which is from the BBC version of Ghosts. Okay. This is beautiful. I know. It's gorgeous. If I were royalty, I'd be like, this is where I summer. I know. This is my mansion. It is is gorgeous. It's like very grandiose and royal looking. Yeah. It's so pretty. It makes me want my Beautiful. own haunted manor even more. Like this is where I would love to live. Yeah. I would it thrive there. It would be there. so easy in a place this big because this is huge. It would be so easy for ghosts to exist and for yes. – even for like people to live there and you never find out because it is so huge. I, I bet yeah. people only use like maximum five rooms and never visit oh. the other parts of it. Oh, and there, I'm about to tell you how many rooms there are because oh. – well, I'll, I'll tell you in a minute. But like it is massive. It's so big. There's a parlor. Oh, literally right next. That's the next thing I have on my list. Great. Um, there's a great parlor, a drawing room, a green library, a great hall, a small dining room. That's probably the size of my apartment. There are many <laughs> bed chambers, a room for the king because 
in case the king was going to stay, they had to have a room for him and a long gallery, which, you know, what's interesting. Leia is excited about the long gallery. Would you like to come here? She, what if she, oh. she's like, oh my gosh, my photograph, my portrait is in that long gallery from her past life oh, of Roy- yeah. as royalty. Maybe that's why I wanted to share it. Yeah. For I do. For people who want to, Leia to is diverge, in the video. She, yeah, she's here. She's cu- snuggled up. I do want to know, when did we move from calling our bedrooms chambers to just mm. bedrooms? Because I much prefer chambers. A that chamber. sounds nice. I, mean, I also love start using it back again. then that with royalty it was like the chamber, but then there was the dressing chamber, and it was a whole different room. And there was like, oh, yeah. I was talking to a friend who was just in Paris, and apparently they used to have a room where people would watch the king awake from his slumber. Oh. Uh. You know what? They watched a lot of weird shit. Like when yes. people would get married and they yes, would come to me. watch There them. was a watching room. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I mean, I Some wouldn't want to be fine. watched, but I would be <laughs> first in line to watch others. Let's be real. I'm judging, but I'm not. You I'm would only have judging like when pom-poms and like blow horns I, yeah. and you're ready I don't to cheer them on. I don't want to be the performer, but I'd be like, it, they were supposed to be in here 15 minutes ago. What's going on? I got here early so I could be first in line. I am front row to the show, baby. Yeah. But yes, I could see that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, as we all picture Corinne cheering on a couple having sex, I will tell you. Woo! So one thing. Woo. You got this. Woo girls. <laughs> We're <laughs> big supporters. Um, okay. So something I didn't realize is that, you know how like all of the old manors have like those really long galleries and it's just like a long hallway? Apparently... The longer the gallery, the wealthier you were. So people oh. wanted to have these longer galleries to be like, "Ooh, look how wealthy I am, and I'm prestigious, and I have I'm better than you." Um, and it was also used for exercising in bad weather. I didn't know that. So you would just like quickly briskly it's like a walk track through your gallery. Yeah. Yes, I do wonder. It's kind of an odd sign of wealth. And it makes me wonder if anyone took it to the extreme where they had a small, smaller, more modest home, but then just extended like a <laughs> long ass rectangular hallway so that they could appear wealth. I mean, that would mm. be odd, but it's just one of those things where it's like, okay. It's like if I were to design a house nowadays and I decided not to have any bedrooms, but it would just be a really long hallway. Right. Exactly. That's my whole home. I'm sure someone's done it. It's basically like a container home, you know? Oh, yeah. Well, but I like guess now we're getting them. Suddenly we're we've created a just a really large studio apartment. I think it's Oh what yeah, we're I guess that's doing in our minds. They should sell studio apartments for like, ooh, your gallery hall apartment. The gallery hall apartment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there was also an attic uh, up in the in the Aston Hall, which housed servants. Um, although I think Aston Hall is stunning and beautiful, I don't necessarily think I want to own it because it's a likely possibility, of course. Um, but because she's very haunted, and I, I'm referring to the house, is very haunted. There's lots mm. of spirits. There are soldiers. There are murder victims. Oh, lots God. of ghosts. Yeah. So... Before I get to all of that stuff, I'll tell you just about the history of Aston Hall. It is one of the last great Jacobian houses, and it took 17 years to complete. It was designed by John Thorpe and built between 1618 and 1635 for Sir Thomas Holt. Thomas was born into a wealthy family who owned quite a lot of land in Warwickshire, And the Holts had a lot of influential friends and family and were in a circle that extended to the royal family. So yeah, they were friends with the royal family, bragging. And when Thomas was 21 years old, his father died, which meant that he then inherited all of the family wealth. And he basically, he was a great businessman. He grew the family wealth exponentially And in 1603, he received a knighthood from King James I. In 1612, Thomas bought the title of baronet and became the highest ranking man among all the local families. 
It was a big yeah. deal. And it does yeah. seem like Thomas really um, – he was a social climber is what I will say. Okay. He liked to be the best. He wanted to be better than everyone around him. Yeah. You know, super unfortunate to be that type of person, but also I can understand that in that time period it was beneficial for like your survival and well-being as a – as a yeah. human to I mean not that you want to like crush people to get where you want to be but yeah. I understand that back in the day you know you needed to it's a bit cutthroat not starve yeah yeah so Thomas commissioned the construction of Aston Hall in 1618 but because it took 17 years to complete he did not move in until 1631 and even then it was still under construction and being completed until 1635. His first wife died before ever being able to see the inside of Aston Hall. And Aww. Thomas and his first wife, whose name was Grace, had 15 children together. 15. Oh my gosh. I do think a lot of them unfortunately died in infancy. Um, right. And there are, yeah, well, I'll get to that in a second. Anyway, Thomas, he worked really hard. He cared a lot about external perception and his wealth but he was a bit of um a he, i was gonna say it nicely but no he was an asshole that's that's the only way to say it <laughs> he was a dick man he was a dick <laughs> he was a certified douchebag <laughs> douche magoosh yeah i mean sounded like it I don't think yeah. you even had to say that from your earlier no. description. I was kind of like, eh, we eh, wouldn't be friends with like him, him probably. No, and no. you would not want to be one of his children either. Um, oh, God. He had favorites when it came to his children. And it's also even safer to say that you were not safe if he did not like you. So his one son, Edward, was sent to work in the household of King Charles I. Edward was his oldest son, so that meant Edward was in line to inherit all of the family fortune if Thomas were to die. Mm -hmm. But when Edward was in London, he met and fell in love with a bishop's daughter and married her despite Thomas's disapproval. True. So love. Thomas basically cuts Edward out of his life, cuts him off from the inheritance entirely and is like never talking to you again. Truly disowns that his son. Sucks. Yeah. He what is he what when people do that like what are they expecting out of their children like you're you're still going to yeah. age and hopefully die before your kids they're not good like hopefully they have 30 40 years to live life however they want without your reign and yeah. influence if you're like that so you can't expect that you're going to dictate how their entire use of your money and what their your resources are going to do so like just freaking let them do what they want. This it's interesting because it feels like Thomas almost treated his family and his family name as if they were royal themselves. Like, you know how the royal family mm -hmm. was very particular about royal blood and that's why there was a lot of incest because, like, they didn't want to, you know, contaminate their their line of ancestors, even though that makes it worse. But <laughs> I feel like Thomas just had the same, like, oh, we, we are just as good as them, meaning that we have to marry the best and yeah. continue our legacy like that which is obviously not correct. And it's, it's like a keeping up with the Joneses, but in the 1600s. Yes. He had so many external and internal pressures on, and on also himself that keeping up with the royal family is I I'm sorry, you're setting yourself up for failure there. Yeah. Yeah. And also who wants that? Live your own life. Anyway, mm -hmm. so Thomas is like hating Edward. He totally disowns his oldest son, but then he's like I love my daughter Elizabeth. So much so that he erected an elaborate monument at St. Cassian's Church for her, which is like so weird. And you're like, oh, maybe Thomas just has a soft spot for his daughters, which maybe I'd agree with you. But he then locked his other daughter, Mary, away for 16 years until she died. Locked her up. What? Yep. Locked her in Aston Hall for 16 years. Rapunzel Why? or Cinderella style, whatever you may, lock the door, throw away the, the key kind of thing. Yep, locked her do, up. Do we know why? Yes, I will tell you. So let me back up. Okay. okay. So Thomas and his family move into Aston Hall in 1631. 
1643, parliamentary troops attacked the house and was severely damaged, which for the most part was repaired over time. But for some reason, they decided to leave. So when the troops attacked, they were like shooting cannons into the house. And for some reason, they decided to leave a cannonball in the staircase. So I'm pretty sure it's still there today. You can see where the troops shot a cannon. The cannonball went through a window, through an open door, and into the banister of the stairs, and it is still there. Which I think is cool so to like just, look it's at. So it's just stuck within the I think banister, so. like the yeah. beams. Yes. Yeah, just because I'm wondering from like a safety perspective how <laughs> it remains there and doesn't kind of like roll off or topple onto someone's head. You know, we'll have to go visit to find out, I guess. Apparently so. Yes. King Charles himself came and visited Aston Hall, so it's good that he had a room for the king. And he and Queen Mary spent the night at the stunning estate on many occasions. And I'm also really hoping that this was before, because I couldn't find out like dates that they stayed, but I'm really hoping it's before Thomas locked his daughter away, because I'm just imagining Mm -hmm. like very Cinderella style, like the royal family sipping tea in the uh, parlor, and you're hearing like banging and screams from another room like, let me out. Yeah, so sad. Yeah. Ugh, little yellow wallpaper style. I'd, I'd go oh, mad. Oh, gosh. Oh, my gosh. Oh, I love that short story. Okay. So dark, but I yeah. Mm-hmm. So at obviously some Obviously, we like it because it's dark. This is yeah, what we do. Uh, we obviously hello. like hello. dark, disturbing stories. <laughs> Does it have murder? Does it have a storyline where they lose their mind? Tell me more. Is there spiritual activity in demons and possession and monsters? Yes. Sign me up. <laughs> Here is my blood. Take a pint. Take all of it. Okay. So anyway, moving on. At some point, and I couldn't really figure out when, Thomas remarried the daughter of another baronet, Anne Littleton. And because, like I said, Thomas had disowned his eldest son, he was trying to have another son with Anne so that he could give his inheritance to a different son. Um, that's how badly he did not want his eldest Edward to get his inheritance. Mm. But unfortunately for Thomas, the son that he and Anne had did not survive infancy. But a daughter did. Her name was Mary. And as Mary grew up, Thomas sought an appropriate suitor for her. And apparently Mary refused his choice. So what do you naturally do when your daughter does not marry the man you want her to marry? You lock her, her in a room. Oh. <laughs> you lock okay. her up. Honestly, both are equally horrifying. <laughs> so, but I was like, hey, it's the 1600s. Maybe they just like behead her. I don't know. He's I a mean, douche. <laughs> so. He basically does. He, I mean, he basically signed a death sentence for her because she truly died. He locked her up oh. for 16 years. There was one story that she tried to run away after refusing the marriage, and that's why he locked her up. But either way, it doesn't even if she ran if she tried to run away or not, you don't lock anyone up. Okay. Right. So apparently he locked her up for 16 years until she died. Apparently she starved to death because Thomas basically forgot about her. I don't know. Oh my God. I don't know. Oh my gosh, I want to cry. And this, this wasn't place was the so only... big too. Like you, I know that you would think that at least like hopefully there would be some like servants or people that lived also in this manner that would help. Yes. So, but everyone was. This is. Thank you for saying that. I agree. A but good segue. This is a great segue because Thomas wasn't only horrific to his daughter. He was also horrific to the servants at Aston Hall. There was truly this, I don't think this exists anymore, but when the, in the original construction of the house, there was an inscription above the fireplace that warned the servants to obey their master and to know their place. Are you kidding me? And that's where they all gang together and they overthrow him. Well, you would think, but thank Mm. you again, Corinne, because another great segue because Thomas apparently murdered his cook. And there are two versions of it. Thomas had a very bad temper, not surprised. And his cook apparently did something to piss him off. So Thomas killed him with a meat cleaver. Or 
There's one maybe a little less believable version of of the story is that Thomas killed the cook by roasting him on a spit. But that's uh, basically know, that's to say, just, yeah. It's so frustrating because as a cook, that person had so many opportunity. I mean, obviously, probably <laughs> after being like berated and abused that many times, you don't actually know when someone's going to go from just like a yes. crazy abuser to a murderer. And so I'm sure he, the, the cook, whoever they were, were, was not expecting to be bludgeoned by a meat cleaver and potentially cooked or eaten. Yeah. And but these people are I'm also like, at uh, the whim of Thomas. Like he's paying them and they probably have families to feed and they they just don't poison, have the power. Just poison him. <laughs> You're the cook. Come on, man. Ugh. Oh, Corinne, if only you were the cook back then. Oh, I for sure would have poisoned <laughs> <laughs> I'm guilty. Yes. So so basically that's to say I think that Thomas had a long record of terrible behavior and treating his servants very poorly, so they probably were all terrified of him. Um, he treated everyone terribly, everyone except for royalty, obviously, because he viewed those, you know, he basically put them up on a pedestal. These are people who are more powerful than me, so he treated them like you know, he was very like charming around them and was like, mm-hmm. bring me up to where you are because he's a sh- social climber. But he was not a great person. Thomas then died on December 14th of 1654. And it wasn't until days before his death that he finally agreed to give Aston Hall and his estates to his family. And even though he had disowned Edward, his son, he gave this, the inheritance to Edward's son, Robert Holt. So Robert inherited the baronet title as well and took over the estate. Thomas was buried in Aston Church and only his wife, Anne, and daughter, Grace, survived him. And as far so as I can find... to me like this yeah. guy led his life trying to be a royal and set everything up to have amazing heirs, ruined all of his relationships with everybody around him, and then yep. right before his death realized that he'd failed and that no one actually was in his life to take what yes. he needed so he had to go back on all of his yes yep. okay what a freaking idiot <laughs> <laughs> um as far as i could find nothing else really notable happened in aston hall under robert's ownership um the holt family lived there until 1817 when they sold it to james watt jr and then in 1858 aston hall was purchased by a private company and turned it into a public park and museum and it's currently owned by the Bringing Birmingham Museums Trust and is open to the public during spring, summer, and autumn months. There are period rooms with furniture, art, and sculpture. And then in October 2019, the manor was named the UK's top haunted site, which apparently is an award gifted to places in the UK. Oh my gosh, this is exactly what we were saying was wrong in... The places that we have looked at in different hotels and, yes. and various sites not wanting to be right. haunted. But in the UK, you get an award. It's like, congratulations. I would love that. The yes. prestige. Yes. The prestige. I wonder what the award looks like. If it's like a plaque, if mm. you get it like sort of like an Emmy. <laughs> or if it's just – Put on your bookshelf. Or if it's just a title, like a certificate. Or maybe it's just like a, a title. Printed out yeah. certificate. Yeah. Yes. You're printed in a magazine. Oh, we should do, oh my gosh, we should pick every year at the end of the year, we should do a, a year in review and pick the most haunted place we think we talked about in the past year and send that place a two girls, one ghost, most haunted. I love that idea. I love that idea. Let's do it. Our own little award show. (laughs) They'll be like, what is this? Who are these people? Why are we getting sent this junk in our mail? And we're like, <laughs> isn't it lovely? You won. A great honor. Get, be oh, gifted to you honor. by two girls, one ghost. <laughs> Wait, I think we should do that. And we should put a page like, like on it. our on our website honoring all of the winners of the years. Yeah. I'll have a vote. It'll be like a true nominee who you think <gasps> from the past year is the best. Oh, our own that's a good idea. Show. We'll have an okay. award show. Okay. All right. Tune back in in December. We're going to do it. Okay. Perfect. Love it. Okay. So as you can tell from the history of this home, there was quite a lot of terrible things that have happened 
There's a lot of negative energy. Thank you, Thomas, for all of your horrible wrongdoings. Um, so it's haunted, quite haunted. Uh, the spirit of his daughter, Mary, who he had locked up in the house, is believed to haunt Aston Hall, which I'm very sad for her, but like she also has every right to haunt it. I just wish she could move on because she spent her life imprisoned there. I would hate to think that the afterlife she's spending in prison there as well. Yeah. Um, she is seen or called the gray ghost. And I'm not really sure if it's because she appears gray in color or if her outfit is gray. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, uh, another, yeah. another ghost that is believed to haunt Aston Hall is the spirit of a young houseboy called Dick. And according to legend, this is another terrible thing that Thomas did in the time of living in Aston Hall. Um, this young boy was accused of stealing and Dick died by suicide. And it's not entirely clear what happened, but based on what I know from Thomas, I'm going to create a scenario that makes sense to me that perhaps when Thomas found out he, or when Thomas accused him of this, the young boy didn't want to be murdered or take the punishment from Thomas himself. And so he, you know, Which I mean, especially if Thomas murdered the cook and was terrible to everyone else, right. like that's how terrified they all were. Well, and murdered him potentially with a meat cleaver. Like, yeah, yeah, it just goes to show how terrifying Thomas was and the what he did, the acts that he yeah. inflicted on people were traumatizing and people would yes. rather pass away than at their own potentially will, yeah. See what he had in store for them, which is horrifying. Yeah. It does remind me of um what's her name? Marie Laveau. Is that her name? Yeah. In New Orleans. Just like the, the mm -hmm. way she was just like torturing people and it was so awful. I know. So his of ghost course. is often seen in the attic and third floor, which used to be the servant quarters. Another popular spirit haunting Aston Halls is the ghost of a former housekeeper who is said to be seen sitting in chairs, walking around the home, and standing in doorways in a green dress. There are also royalist soldiers that have been spotted along the property. It is just filled with spirits. And I feel like based on everything that I was reading, they all just seem to be lingering. They don't really interact with people a ton. They're just there mm -hmm. kind of coexisting. Um, I do like the idea of this um, housekeeper who's just like now at, in her spirit life, like living in the house, you know? She's like, yeah. I am done serving here. I get to enjoy to the reside. luxurious. Yeah, I'm going to sit on this bed. My five hundred you, rooms. Thomas. Yeah. Yes. So it's filled with spirits. But Thomas seems to have moved on, which is annoying to me, um, especially considering how he reluctantly left the house to his grandson. I just... Based on his personality, I, I would have figured he'd be the type of spirit to like hold grudges and haunt. Right. But maybe he's in hell. Maybe instead he <clears throat> is suffering in the afterlife and that would be great. Yeah. I know. I feel, I feel, yeah, that's the hope. It is frustrating yeah. though when other spirits who are victims obviously of Thomas end up not moving on and, and whether it's yeah. like a fraction of their soul or, or their entire being are stuck there, are there and Thomas isn't. But at the same time, I'm glad they're not there with the person with who him. tormented them. Yeah, that's true. It should be either be him solo or him in hell. So yes. let's hope. Yes, hell. Hell it is. Mm -hmm. That's just the narrative I'm going to go with. So today, Aston Hall is open for tours and to the public. They have a bunch of fun events. They have a wildlife walk, an arts club, a baby boogie. They have burger fests. And when they're approaching the fall... They host ghost tours and fright nights. Yes. And they also host, well, I actually, this was interesting to see. They host kid-friendly ghost tours that, and it says like those without children are not well, like are not recommended to join those ones. Oh. Do you hear that? Yeah. What is that? I don't know. Sound like the, power uh, the ghost of Thomas. <laughs> He's coming for you. He sounds like a duck. He's been turned <laughs> into a duck in this life. Uh, yeah, I do wonder what the what the kid tours entail. I feel like it would just be fun, like a little bit silly. Yeah, but I'm curious about the baby boogie. What is that? Oh, it baby's boogieing, of course. 
It's just a bunch. They clearly love children, which I'm happy that there's so much joy and kindness towards the children, yeah. given that Thomas's own children in their lives did not get such empathy or compassion mm-hmm. extended to them. So I it's do nice like that all the kids think- get to go on dance parties and ghost tours. I love it. I do like to think also that like maybe Thomas's spirit was at Aston Hall for a little while, but then the company that took over it and made a public, you know, museum and park started doing all these like kid and family friendly events. And Thomas was like, I can't take it anymore. Yeah. And they filled it with love and joy. And then he was like, this is literally my personal hell. Yeah. And then he left. And then he left. Poof. Bye. Poof. Bye, bitch. I'm You're swearing off. I'm getting like really angry in this episode. I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm like, he's an idiot. <laughs> swearing and We apologies. hate you. We hate you. I'm so excited for yours. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. The one that you could have done 10 episodes on. Yes. I won't say who I'm doing quite yet because I am leading into it. But I of will course. say I texted Sabrina. I said, I'm devastated. I need a 10-part series. And you were like, you can do a few parts if you want. And I was like, well, that's not how we've done the show before. And I don't want to like I, – I don't know. I was I was really flustered. Yeah. But – I was know, like, we can make our own rules. Exactly. We grow. We develop as a show. So, you know yeah. what? Maybe in the future we'll do multiple, multiple parts because there have been yeah. so many topics so far where we've like, you know, really – it's been really challenging to not tell – everything that's so fascinating and interesting about yeah. these people and these stories and everything that contributed to make it as paranormal and as it is. Obviously, I'm not going to spoil who you chose, but the person you chose to talk about is like gr- three like seasons greatly worth. famous. Yeah. Greatly famous. Okay. <clears throat> okay. In 1874... Mm-hmm. Eric Weiss was born in Hungary before moving with his family to Appleton, Wisconsin, where they lived on Appleton Street, which I lo- just love. They like moved to Appleton to live on Appleton Street. It's just, it feels very, you know, it, serendipitous. it feels fun. Serendipitous. Yeah. And I'm sure as a child, it was very fun. So yeah. not long after, Eric, he ran away from home, hoping to secure better job opportunities to support his family back then. They were very, mm-hmm. very poor. And he had taken a bunch of odd jobs as a child and was just like, I, I can't, there's only so much I can do here. I need to, to move on, run away, find something else because my family won't let me go and send money home. So he was still very much trying to be a part of his family, but also was taking some ownership himself as a young child, which is very sad, to try to support the rest of his family, his siblings and his parents. So not long after, the family packed their bags once again, and then they moved to New York City. And Eric, he actually- The Big Apple. The Big Apple, baby. From Appleton Appleton to the Big Apple. To Appleton, yeah, Appleton Street and Appleton to the Big Apple. So very Mm -hmm. Apple-themed in this guy's life. So he, you know, figures out that his family's moving there. His dad moves first, then he ends up following his dad, then the rest of his family comes out, and they all settle in New York City. At nine years old, Eric becomes a trapeze artist. That's one of his jobs. He also works for some time. At nine years old. He also works like alongside a locksmith. He's like doing a bunch of different jobs. Hmm. And as a trapeze artist, this is sort of one of the jobs he had that contributed to his love of performance and magic and illusions. This is where it was born. Teasing us. Yes, teasing you. So Eric took many more jobs. He traveled the U.S. to to perform his magic tricks. And though his magic shows were off to a slow start, he eventually had a breakthrough career moment when he met his manager who advised him to focus on his escape acts. And part of of one of his odd jobs in the past, which was working alongside a locksmith, actually contributed to him being able to kind of like tinker with and figure out all of these like magic tricks and handcuffs and, and, and entrapments and everything and made him or started his journey to become an amazing illusionist. Mm. So soon, Eric, after meeting this manager and getting this this moment and, and advice with his career, he starts traveling all over the world. He's performing his escape acts, his illusions, his card tricks, his outdoor stunts in places like the Netherlands and Germany and France and Russia. He drew huge crowds, some of whom thought that he 
must have been a real sorcerer because what he was doing seemed impossible. So many other people could not do it, could not figure yeah. out how he did it. There were so many times where people thought he was about to die and he he didn't. He always escaped. And that is exactly how he wanted it. Eric challenged local police in each city to restrain him and lock them in the local jails. They would strip him nude. They would search him, handcuff him, and Eric would always escape. Oh, my gosh. So people started referring to him as the handcuff king. But we all know him by the name of Harry Houdini. (laughs) Where did that name come from? I don't think I ever knew his non-stage name. Okay, so I should... I should have written this down. So I'm just going from from memory right now. Yeah. There was Using that big brain of yours. (laughs) At the time, there was a famous magician, I believe, whose last name was Houdin. And Eric had misunderstood kind of some of the translations, I think, in French and thought the adding an I at the end of the name meant like similar to. So I think he took that. It was kind of like an homage. So like Houdin became... Houdini. So you kind of stole some other magician's name? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and he and liked alliteration. Name, right. And then his name, Eric, when he moved to the U.S., changed from Eric or like the, the tra- not translation, but like the way it was spelled changed basically from uh, one version to like Aunt Henri and then it kind of like morphed a little bit into... Hmm. Or like it was like Eric and then it sounded more like Henri. And so basically it was like kind of Henry, like the the there was just many different interesting. It just of evolved. Transformations yeah, I mean, a over lot of people, time and where they moved and where they lived and where they were influenced that that yeah. changed the pronunciation, the spelling, and the influence of his his name. Okay. Also a lot of people changed their name when they came to the States. So that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people did. Their last names tried to Americanize. And so, yes. yeah, there, there was some of that to kind of fit in with with who they were surrounded by and what the family yeah. was doing and spending – who they were spending time with. I could have butchered that a bit because, again, I didn't write this down. I'm just trying to remember what, what I read. Um, so, yeah, he's who, Harry Houdini. Okay. So while Harry Houdini became one of the greatest paid performers and is still considered today as one of the greatest illusionists and magicians of all time, he also had an interest in what was beyond illusion. Is magic real? Is the spirit world real? Mm. Before he found success, so before he met his manager who had helped him kind of along the way, Harry Houdini and his wife actually spent a stint traveling around as spiritualists. So Houdini, he would tie himself to a chair or like be tied to a chair. He would pretend to go into a trance. The curtains would close. He would escape the binds. He would come back out and it was like, you know, the spirits had helped him. They untied him from this impossible restraint. And then there were some times where he would approach the edge of the stage and he would close his eyes and he would pretend to be a medium to like channel the spirit through Uh. him and deliver a message. And there was one time where he pretended to contact a murder victim who would had their throat slit and Harry Houdini was like, he was describing or like spelling out the name of the victim and the way that he performed it. And let's remember a lot of people totally believed in spiritualism as, as a movement. They thought, you know, like the spirit photos were real. Everything was real. Yeah. He scared so many people that people were running from the theater (gasps) thinking that he was like truly possessed. So this guy was a, he was a performer. performer. He was great. Have you seen Nightmare Alley? No. What is okay, that? Okay, it's a movie that came out this past year, and it just reminds me of this a lot. Okay. I need to watch it. Will you? T- can you text it to me now so I don't forget? Yeah, I'll text it to you right now. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah. Let's see. Nightmare uh, Alley. Perfect. There you go. <coughs> so, oh, I was like, why'd you just, I'm so stupid. I'm like, oh, you just texted me. <laughs> I'm dying. Uh, okay. <laughs> Will you text me? Oh, why'd you just text me? Oh, why did you just text me? It's like, you know, when you're like trying to text someone something in a room full of people, like don't bring this up or don't say this. And then they're like, oh, why did you just text me from, from across the room? And you're like, oh, oh God, no. why did you say it out loud? Palm to so face. So bad. Palm to face. Yes. Yeah. I want to kick them under the chair. 
Okay, so Houdini and his wife, they actually were a part of the spiritualist movement for a little bit of time. But honestly, it was out of a bit of desperation and just some of intrigue. Uh, right. But then, you know, Harry Houdini, he meets his manager. He zeroes in more on what types of performances he's going to do. He is really good at making sure he's in the newspapers and he's being talked about and he's taking on challenges. Oh, one of – okay. I was like, oh, I need many, many parts of of this – this podcast to like talk about Harry Houdini because there's so much I want to talk about and I won't go off script that much because otherwise it will turn into a 10 part but I want to give one example of of something cool he did basically to keep himself relevant and in the newspapers and it was here in Boston he He did a lot in Boston Um, Uh so here in Boston these local like pretty hoity-toity wealthy businessmen were like they basically dared him. They were like, Harry Houdini, I bet you won't uh, lock yourself in a sea monster and escape from a- inside of a sea monster. And so he oh. was like, okay, bet. And then he came out here to Boston. They had captured somewhere in the sea. It's – the records weren't amazing back then. And there's not a mm-hmm. lot of, like, evidence. There's, like, a little bit of photo evidence. And we basically just have to go off of these, like – really animated, exaggerated newspaper clippings. But essentially, what it's thought is that there was a turtle that was like 500 years old that came down from Nova Scotia and was captured off of the coast of Massachusetts. It was huge, huge turtle. Harry Houdini, small guy. I think I think I'm like 50 pounds heavier than him and maybe taller okay. than him. He's little. <laughs> good for escaping. Also good for getting stuffed into this turtle. So basically what happened was- Makes me sad for the turtle. So sad for the turtle, right? Yeah, it was horrible. I think they killed the turtle basically to do this. Well, So they called it this like- Yeah. Yeah. They called it this big sea monster that they like this crazy, they crack in sea monster, whale, turtle, mix, like horrible creature. That's how they advertised it. And then they had Harry Houdini. There was like a taxidermist who came and basically covered the thing with like arsenic and all these chemicals. So basically Harry Houdini was like stuffed into a poisoned turtle. He was stitched inside of it, literally stitched inside of the turtle, dropped into the Charles River, and he had to escape. And he did. I'm disturbed. Man, the things you do to stay in the newspaper. I don't think you need to do that, Harry. (laughs) You could have skipped that one. I, it's yeah. so funny how like moments ago we were just like, does it have murder? Does it have demons? Sign me up. But this is where I think I draw the line. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of people too, because that's actually one of the facts about Harry Houdini that people don't. There's a lot of things he did that were really interesting. But for some reason, that one doesn't come up that much. It's almost like a hidden story. And I think it's because no one wants to talk about it. No one wants so to talk gross. about it. Yeah. It's just yeah. so disturbing. Okay. But that's yeah. an example. So okay. he's. He's becoming great. He's traveling the world. He and his mm-hmm. wife are doing all of these things. His mom is involved. Like she's coming on stage for certain things. Like he's drawing crowds. He's always in the newspaper. He's collaborating wow. with other magicians and illusionists and and making friends in high places. But yeah. then his mother dies. And Houdini once again found himself back involved in spiritualism. Because his mom had been one of his biggest supporters. His family grew up dirt poor. They had literally yeah. nothing. I mean, he was working like before he was nine years old, like trying to support his family. Yeah, so young. She would make – when they had nothing, she still would make his magic show costumes. She believed Ugh. in him. She encouraged him. She participated in his shows, whether he had one audience member or thousands. And right. so when he, she passed away, it was – it was like the end of the world to him. He fainted so actually sad. when he received the news of his mom's death. Aww. He became very depressed. He canceled a leg of his uh, European tour and he was often seen visiting his mother's grave lying face down on top of the grave <gasps> on the grass just having oh these long conversations with her just trying to talk to her. So wow. very, very sad. He clearly was yeah. in a very dark place and needed a way to contact her. Yes. So – Because he was hoping to make contact with his mom, he decided to visit many mediums. And it was here that he realized just how fraudulent the industry was. So he began to debunk mediums on his journey to find contact with his mother's spirit. He 
Houdini, as we know, was an expert in sleight of hand and illusions. So he was the perfect person to attend all of these seances, wow. to meet all of these these mediums <sighs> and like observe it with a critical critical I eye and debunk it. Love this because he's he's not saying it doesn't exist. He's just trying to like call people out for scamming people. Exactly. Exactly. In a search for more proof of and the ability to talk to his mom. That's exactly how it was. Yeah. And so he actually offered a cash prize to anyone who could prove that it was real, which drew more people to him, gave him the yeah. opportunity to debunk more people. And so psychic after psychic became victim to Houdini as he exposed their false practices. Understandably, many mediums and psychics feared Houdini. A lot of people, yes. a lot of big people did not want to come to Houdini's challenge because they knew or thought, you know, there's the potential of him proving that what they were doing was trickery and they were taking and it advantage could ruin their of career. people. Yeah. Right. Uh, but that did not mean that he left them alone. No. Harry Houdini, he would put on fake mustaches, fake beards. He would go in oh my disguise. Gosh, disguise. Yes. He would attend these seances. He would bring up like a police officer or a journalist or someone with him. And he would watch. He would observe. He would participate. And once he realized during the seance or reading or whatever he was attending, once he thought he collected enough evidence, he would like rip off his mustache. And he'd stand up and be, I am Harry Houdini and you are fake. And Corinne, it was I feel like you... <laughs> were Houdini in a past life or need to play Houdini in uh, this life because you are embodying him perfectly. I am so passionate about Harry Houdini's story. I can tell. <laughs> I really am. It oh, shines man. through. Thanks, Harry. Me and Harry. <laughs> me and Eric. You're channeling him right now. <laughs> He's Harry. coming through me. He's finally proving that the paranormal does exist. So... <laughs> He would basically be like, you're a fraud. And people would be like, oh, no, shit. That was Harry Houdini. <laughs> you got um, me. You got me. Totally winks. Rats. So, rats. So startling, I'm sure, but very effective. He debunked many of the huge names in the spiritualist movement. He also attacked spiritualism at all angles. Spirit mm. photography was a huge trick during the time. We've talked about it many times over the past five yeah. years of this podca podcast. Podcast. And to prove it was fake, he had himself photographed with Abraham Lincoln's spirit. Mm. And at the height of his career, with all of his money and all of his success and all of his performances, he still spent his free time exposing who he called the vultures who preyed on the bereaved. He published his findings in a book called A Magician Among the Spirits. And he even added a section in, onto his live performances where he would show, basically like expose magic tricks Whoa. Showing how magicians and these like mediums would create fake ectoplasm and fool everyone. So he was basically he like, broke here's all, all my the magician's rules. He did. Yes. He was like, he, I'm escaping all of these binds and, and that's and awesome. How. I'm not going to talk about how I do this. Oh. But, but then he was oh, like, so he would basically not where, out his own stuff. He would out everyone else's stuff. So everyone probably hated him. Yeah. I mean, but here's the thing about outing his own stuff. It was about understanding the how like the contraptions and the binds and things worked and like his muscles and his Couldn't like, he like dislocate stuff and like I think a so. lot of like Yeah. There's a lot of like mo yeah, movement and he also understood how the locking mechanisms of so many things worked as well. So he mm. would like intently study everything that he was bound to do. So it wasn't I mean, everyone was yeah. in disbelief because, like, they couldn't do it themselves, but it was never made to be, like, truly, truly impossible. He did it. Therefore, it was possible. But it's possible. Yeah. For he for the spiritualist movement, he was like, it's not your, your dead mom coming to visit you. This is what they're doing. This is how they're doing Interesting. it. Interesting. So he literally was, like, exposing everyone while at the height of his success, using his platform to be like, don't be fooled. Wow. So – now, Harry Houdini, he can definitely be considered a skeptic and yeah. an old-timey guy. But while his string of debunkings maybe would make you presume sometimes that he was turning into the idea of, of thinking like the spirit world wasn't true and didn't exist after encountering person after person after person after person who was falsely making contact with the spirit right. world, he uh, actually was still quite open to the idea that there was something 
out there, that something real could could exist beyond what we knew in what we could see in front of us. Of course. He continued to attempt to contact the spirit world and unlock his powers, not to prove that you couldn't, but to see if you could. So during his life, Houdini made a pact with a few of his friends that if he died before them, he would contact them. He would give them these secret messages that only they would know, and they would know for sure it was him if they somehow received this message, this secret this message is kind that of individually, one-on-one, only he knew. This yeah, is kind of like not. what we did. Yes. Remember I said purple underwear is what I'll tell a stranger to go tell you. Yeah, but now everybody knows. Okay, fine. We'll talk about it. <laughs> you and I need to come up with something individually by ourselves and not tell anyone. Ooh. Okay, people, okay, people should comment below what our thing should be, and Corinne and I will pick our favorite, but we won't tell everyone what we pick. Mm. Okay, well, there might be some problems with that, and I'll tell you why in a second. Oh, okay. No, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Well, uh, I want, okay. 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 <laughs> we want to involve everyone, but we also want authenticity, you know? We want to know yeah. that it's real, and hopefully we die at the exact same moment, so we never have to- Holding hands at Area 51, so. Exactly. Yeah. That's the plan. That's the plan. <laughs> Hot ballooning over Area 51. Our balloon gets shot down. That's how we're going to go. So we're gonna, holding hands. We'll, we'll live stream it. <laughs> <laughs> we take our tops off in the hot air balloon. <laughs> <laughs> go out having fun. <laughs> Free the nipples. Spray paint on the side of our basket. With our hairy armpits out. <laughs> yeah, baby. The Groovy. woolly mammoths. <laughs> We're like only playing the Moana soundtrack. It's just like the most random experience anyone could have ever seen. Maybe we survive because everyone's just like, who the hell is what? that? They, they clearly are. They don't know where they are or what they're doing. Let's just let the balloon no. pass over. Because <laughs> we, we've lost our minds at that point because our brains are we, no longer working. We have no we survive. ability. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. yeah. You'd be like, you can Good show plan. me everything. My brain's going to wipe in two seconds anyway. I'm truly... Yeah. Never going to remember what I see. You might want to study my brain, honestly. It might be beneficial to all of you because (laughs) there's something wrong. There's truly. Brain fog is getting worse and worse over these years. So by the time we're there, I'll be dust. Dust. Okay. Okay. So he made these packs with his friends and with his wife. And he also began to do his own tests as well using one of his most trusted people in his life, his wife, Bess, to help him. And there's so many examples of things that he did with Bess to try to, you know, see beyond just like contacting mediums and and exposing them. (coughs) Excuse me. If the spirit world was real. One of them being, remember, in episode 164, when we went to the William Westerfeld house in San Francisco, and I told you that he used one of the top rooms to try to... yes. Yeah. Telepathically like send messages to his wife across the bay. And mm-hmm. it didn't really work, or at least it wasn't yeah. like, written down if it did. Um, so that's an example of like one of the things that he would do. Like they were constantly trying to see if they could unlock their own powers, tap into it, and see if anyone else had already ha- elevated their abilities as well. Yeah. So Houdini was doing all of these things, and then he also started to believe that he would die soon. He started getting these sort of like weird premonition-y witchy feelings okay so he had actually clipped out an article from a newspaper about a performer who had fallen ill but had continued to play until he couldn't go on any further which was odd that he clipped out this newspaper clipping and like kept it in his belongings and it only really started to be creepy and premonition like after he passed which i'll tell you how he he passed away in a minute um and then in october of 1926 Houdini called a friend and asked him to rush over with a car and help him move things out of his house. So they loaded up the car. They started to drive. And then Houdini, he freaks out. He goes, we have to go back. We have to go back. And the guy, his friend Joe, who picked him up, was like, why? Like, it's pouring rain. They grabbed all this stuff. And he's like, don't ask questions, Joe. Just turn around and go back. So they turn around. They go back. He stops the car. He's sitting in the car, like, idle. And Harry Houdini, he gets out. Of the car, he stands there in the pouring rain. It's just drenching his clothes. And he's just standing there for a few minutes looking up at his house. And his friend is like, I don't know what's going on. What's going on? Just, yeah, sitting in the car like literally something's happening. And I I can't, I don't know what's happening. So then Harry gets back in the car. He's sopping wet. Yeah. And he begins to cry. 
And he tells his friend, I've just seen my house for the last time, Joe. I'll never see my house again. Oh. So he knew something he knew was going to happen dying. to him. Might yes. have chills. Oh, whoa. Days later, Houdini was unknowingly performing on stage in Montreal with appendicitis. He continued the show until he couldn't any longer. He passed out backstage <gasps> and his appendix ruptured. There's a lot of... Days later. Days later. Yeah, this is October. This is, yeah, days later. And there's Whoa. a lot of speculation as to what actually happened to him because it's thought it's thought that he might have already had appendicitis and that he didn't know at the time because it wasn't bothering him yet. But then when he was backstage at the show, a few kids from, a few of the students from McGill University had come back and some kid was like, oh, is it true that you can take like really hard blows to the stomach and it won't affect you? And Houdini was like laying down and he was like, yeah, but only if I like know to brace myself first. But before he could like get all that out, the guy thought it was like permission to punch him. So he mm. starts like punching him like full speed into his stomach. Oh. But apparently there's there's not enough like correlation or evidence that having a blow to your stomach can also rupture your appendix. So it's mm. thought that that didn't – I mean that obviously caused him pain. But it's thought right. that he already had appendicitis and it just so happened that the punch also happened on like the same night that his appendix would get worse and rupture. So, so lesson here is don't, don't punch people. <laughs> don't let people punch you. Well, he wasn't – he wasn't giving him permission. <laughs> well, it sounds just, like he had given a lot of people permission in the past. So it was like a thing that he did. Yeah. Part of his part of his performance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So unfortunately that that happened. So Jeez. he like passes out backstage. He's like, close the curtains, close the curtains, because he's in so he's like doubled over with pain. Uh, and his appendix ruptures. <clears throat> On wow. Halloween. Halloween of 1926 when the veil between the spirit world and ours is at its thinnest harry houdini passed away and he finally found his answer after passing corinne his wife we I have to <laughs> die at area 51 together at old age on halloween yes yeah with maybe some like harry houdini handcuffs holding okay, both of us let's together let's shake on it let's little- shake on it A little homage to to Harry Houdini himself. (laughs) So after passing, his wife Bess was at a loss for what to do without him. She began holding Houdini seances every Sunday at the hour of his death. She would take a photograph of him into a room with her. She would shut the door and she would wait for him to give her a sign. She also offered a $10,000 reward to anyone who could give her the correct message that Harry Houdini... That they had decided? Yes, their secret message. Many people tried. Only one succeeded. It was a famous medium named Arthur Ford. He came forward with a message from Houdini's mother that said, forgive. And then a message from Houdini himself that said, Rosabelle, answer, tell, pray, answer, look, tell, answer, answer, tell. Rosabelle had been their secret word. It was the title of a song that was popular in Coney Island where they first met. And the rest was basically like a series of code that was used during Houdini's mind reading act. And so however the code is like deciphered, it basically, and like Bess knew the code, it meant believe. It spelled out believe. So the message was Rosabelle, their secret code, and then believe. Stop. So Bess was like, oh my gosh. This is Houdini. It's real. He's come forward. Whoa. But then they're concerned. And this is why I was saying, like, if if we chose from people's suggested messages, it might cause a problem. Because concerned friends and family would not let her give the $10,000 award and thought that that Ford was a fraud. A lot of people don't know how he could have discovered that message and and known that message. And, you know, Bess was looking for the sign. So maybe she was a little more open to it. But other people speculated that, Ford just got really lucky in stringing together Mm. some of the things that were already out there in various print about his life, like when they first met. That's a really good guess, though, and to understand and know the code that they had with each other. Right. Right. Yeah. So was it Houdini? Was it not? We don't really know. We don't know. 
the last Houdini seance was held on Halloween night, 10 years after Houdini died. Bess, a group of their friends, magicians, scientists, and occultists, gathered in Hollywood on the roof of Knickerbocker Hotel, and a broadcast was sent over the radio recording the seance. They oh asked gosh. for a sign. They had brought bells. They said, please ring the bell. We have chalk for you to write a message. We have a pencil and paper if you want to yeah. write a message, if you want to push any of the stuff anywhere. There's handcuffs. Make it clink. Make it unlock. There's a chair. There's a table. Move it. Levitate it. They were waiting. They were pleading. They were asking him and encouraging him to leave a sign. But there right. was nothing. Nothing um. happened. At midnight. I do feel like Houdini, though, would be the type of spirit who was like, I don't want to do it for a show for everyone. Like, I, it, I feel like he would take spiritual connection very intimately and like it has to be an intimate experience. I love that you said that because that makes a lot of sense <laughs> given that in the past he spent a lot of his career trying to basically essentially have people not monetize yeah. it and like – be fraudulent with this. And so, of course, yeah, he didn't want to create a show of it, even though it was being broadcast. And this is yeah. a really nice segue into saying that at midnight, once the broadcast was done, or essentially at midnight, mm -hmm. Bess Houdini was asked what she wanted to do because the night was over, the 10 year anniversary of his death had passed. And she yeah. said, Yes, Houdini did not come through. My last hope is gone. I do not believe that Houdini can come back to me. Or to anyone. Oh my the Houdini heart. shrine has burned for 10 years. I now reverently turn out the light. It is finished. Good night, Harry. They end the broadcast. And just then, an extremely violent thunderstorm breaks out. It cracked so loud like the sky was opening up. Lightning so bright and terrifying, it drenched all of the participants of the seance on this roof. They ran for cover. Afterwards, it is realized that this freakish flash thunderstorm only occurred right over the Knickerbocker Hotel, nowhere else. It was not anywhere else in Hollywood. It was directly over the hotel. Stop it. I know. I have so many chills. <sighs> I'm shook. I, That's right? amazing. And it's, it's so – and also like – he oh is gosh. the greatest showman, you know? Yes. Like, of course, he he basically, like, like the god he was, like, of a performer, cracks the sky open and drenches everybody. And he's like, don't forget me. I am here. Just not in the way that oh everyone else presents gosh. and expects the paranormal to come through. That is so freaking cool. He's so cool. So Harry's, Harry Houdini's spirit continues to leave signs of or from the other world, and people continue to hold seances for him. In the 1970s in Niagara Falls, a medium called for Houdini, and a flower pot and a book immediately crashed to the ground. And the book that was on the ground was about Houdini's life, and it opened, it was crashed down and had opened, fallen to a page where Houdini had written, Do the Dead Return? Question mark. And so he okay. leaves a lot of signs like that still throughout the decades, or people believe it's Houdini mm -hmm. coming through. Yeah. And so Harry Houdini finally figured out how to communicate with the other side, but just like with his illusions and escape tricks, he just needed to study it intimately from the inside to figure out how to reach out. Wow, that was beautifully written, Corinne. Thanks. Using uh, that brain of yours. There you go. It's because I have written down – I had like partially done this research maybe half a year ago, maybe more. Yeah. It has been in my like podcast research Google Doc for yeah. a long, long time. And it was pages. Yeah. It was like, it was like 50 pages. That's why I was like, oh, Sabrina, I'm struggling. <laughs> what is it? It's been floating. Awesome. It's been taking up space in my brain for so long. And now you now can, finally I can finally let it go. It's out. I can finally speak English again and focus on other things. You've told Houdini's story. He came Again. in. He channeled himself through you. And yes, this is another sign that Houdini is leaving behind in the universe is through you, Corinne. Isn't that amazing, though? And there's He's, so much more. There's so I know. much more. Ugh. He's but amazing. Yeah. It's I just love 
that he did what I think a lot of people struggle to do, which is waver somewhere in between being a skeptic and a full on believer. He yes, was. We fail at doing that. We're full on we, believers. We're terrible. Okay. Full. Yeah. Full believer here. And it was, but it was coming from the best place in his heart where he was like, I think that there's something else. I think we can make contact. I believe in our abilities to do something greater. And I believe that there is more yeah. beyond our life. But I also know that there's a lot of people that take advantage of people's beliefs. And so he was yes. trying to find that balance in between. And I think he did a really great job of it. And it's it's kind of funny because he was in the beginning a part of it with his like pretend possessions. And yeah. only once he lost someone himself did he realize how how much damage it, it does to, to feel like you're experiencing something and for it yeah. to turn out to have been faked for Yeah, for I mean – the way you were saying that he was he was channeling and and obviously now retrospective is fake, but the a murder victim like imagine being the family of that that poor innocent person and and seeing right. that and and it sounds like it was really horrific. So it wasn't like he was like oh this message is coming through. It was like he was like displaying the pain that the poor person was experiencing in death. So it yeah. is that is horrific. And that was the problem, I think, with a lot of spiritualism was that it wasn't it wasn't marketed as a show. It wasn't marketed as like yeah. theater or an experience. It was marketed as yeah. the, the absolute truth, that this is right. real. And people believed it and people wanted to believe it. And I mean, I, I feel like still today there are a lot of people who – that's why like when we had when we talked to Michelle T on um Campfire Stories she was like I never charge for this and people shouldn't charge for this. Like that's I think how you know when someone's being honest with you or versus right. like trying to steal money. And obviously like there are some that you pay for and we've done that before but like I do think there is a lot of there are a lot of people out there who could manipulate this type of career for their own benefit and not necessarily caring yeah. about everyone else in it who's going to them and seeking answers. Right. It's a hard line because it's like you want – you obviously want to – like if you did have the ability to do that and you could tap into it, you obviously want to share that with everybody. Yeah. But in order to yeah. like truly share it as much as as you want and to benefit others, like you do need to survive and live. And so I understand right. people that obviously charge for it. But then, yeah, it does – there's – it's so difficult to know, like maybe like the 95% of people that are are fraudulent and right. those that truly can. It, we don't know. Yeah. So. That's why I feel like if I ever go to see a medium or a psychic or anything, I would take references and recommendations from people. I wouldn't just like blindly go in somewhere. Right. Yeah. Although it is interesting. I still think about that one spiritual shop that's now closed in Santa Cruz, California that I went to in 20, yeah, like 2009 or something. And it was like to a T, everything. And I was like, ooh, I this know. lady is legit. Yeah. So I, sometimes you happen upon it and then sometimes it's like, okay, that was nothing. <laughs> my, my dream mind. is still like to be walking in the grocery store and someone like taps me on the sh shoulder and is like, I'm really sorry, but I have to tell you this. I have a message for you. That's oh, like my ugh, yes. dream. I know. Dream. That would be awesome. Why doesn't that happen to us? <laughs> Yet. Yet. It will. Yet. There's many, will. many, what? There, there's much life ahead of us. Much life. Many more days. Many more opportunities. Many more days. Okay. okay. Listener I'm stories. assuming you picked an old timey ghost listener story. Um, I believe I did. Let's see. Who did I pick? Okay. Okay. I did. And like I couldn't find a Victorian era ghost story. I found it for our listener story. This is from our listener, Laura, and it is called One Old Freaky Victorian. Hello, fellow ghost loving gals. I just wanted to start off by saying that I absolutely love listening to your show and it is so nice to know that there is a whole community of people out there that are just as obsessed with paranormal activity as I am. Yes. Ayo. There's a lot <laughs> of us. 
There's a lot of us. Although I do have to confess, my boyfriend is a little concerned about my obsession and tells me that I annoy the living (laughs) crap out of him because I talk about your show all the time. So thank you for being so paranormally amazing and helping me annoy my boyfriend. Amazing. (laughs) Now, before I start my spooky tale, I think it's important to mention where my obsession with the ghostly realm stems from. So I grew up in an old-ass Victorian house right outside of Philadelphia. To clarify, I don't mean a pretty Victorian with a modern twist that you see in rom-coms. No. My parents decorated this house to make you feel like you are walking through a door and entering 130 years into the past. Growing up in this house is what sparked my interest in the paranormal and made me the ghost-loving gal I am today. I want to come visit this house, Laura. I know. So let's begin my story of that freaky, old-ass Victorian house. While I was growing up, my dad was extremely interested in the history of our house and always took my four sisters and I to the town hall or library to find out more information on it. So cool. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this was before the convenience of the internet. Through our family's intense research, we discovered that our home, which has a circa 1900 plaque right on the front, was actually built in the 1880s, but was rebuilt in 1900 after a fire had nearly burned the whole place down. From there, it remained a single family home until a man and his family bought it in the early 30s. They purchased the house and converted the rooms into small apartments, which they rented out until the 70s. When the father died, his daughter took over and lived in the house until the early 90s. However, while the house's rooms were being rented out, we discovered that at least three people had died in it. One was an old man that had passed away peacefully in his sleep. Another was a little boy around the age of eight whose cause of death was unknown. Mm. and a young guy in his early 30s who choked to death. Oh, gosh. Growing up, the stories of the deaths never bothered me. Actually, my little sister and I enjoyed them and made names for the three dead people that we believed to still be in the house. I forget the other two, but I remember we named the 30-something guy Fred. Fred (laughs) was pretty cool, and he never harmed any of us, but he did enjoy turning my dad's stereo on and off in the middle of the night. The weird thing about the stereo, though, was the volume. It would go up and down, up and down, and then just turn off. My dad, who is an electrician, always blamed it on the wiring. But one night, the stereo turned on by itself again, and my little sister yelled down to the basement where the stereo was located and said, Fred, turn that off, please. And a second later, he did. Ah, My dad still blamed it on the wiring, but my sister and I knew that it was definitely Fred. Now... Fred's little shenanigans weren't the only paranormal activity in the house. One night while I was in fifth grade and my sister was in third, we were changing into our pajamas when a huge glowing black orb appeared right under the ceiling. No joke. A few seconds after, this thing started growing long legs and flying around the room. Oh! And yes. I never thought about that, (laughs) about just like, I always think of like, the full body apparition being completely separate than the orb and to think that it like just shot out legs. I was like running with its little orb body through the air. Oh, that's weird. That's freaky. It's so weird. And yes, I swear this happened and it was actually glowing, glowing. I looked at my little sister and she was as white as a ghost. We screamed at the top of our lungs and ran as fast as we could down the stairs. My parents heard us and ran to us from their spot in the kitchen. We ran into their arms and told them what we saw, but when we came back to our room, it was gone. This huge, glowing, black, flying creature with long legs had completely vanished. And guess the night that this happened? October 31st. Coincidence? I think not. The veil was thin on that the Halloween veil was night. Thin. I do love the idea of like ghosts being like, it's Halloween. Let's scare some kids. Let's run amok, baby. Do Release the yourselves. Thing we can do. Release just <laughs> your long legs. Yeah. <laughs> they have like a competition. It's like who who does the weirdest, freakiest, most creative thing on this night? That, who this can is pretty creative. Creatively, yes. After that occurrence, it was pretty quiet around the house. Not much ghostly activity, and we all stopped believing that our house was ever haunted or had any ghosts. That oh. is until my mom actually saw Fred in 2012. 
She was doing laundry and called for my dad to come get his clothes that she left in the living room. She thought my dad was behind her and she was about to tell him to bring up his clothes when she saw this tall, slender man in an all-jean work uniform that looked like it was stained with oil. His face was dirty and his eyes looked really sad. My mom gasped, dropped the laundry, and the man vanished. After that, she screamed, and my sisters and I ran down to make sure she was okay. Naturally, none of us really believed her story, and we just wrote her off for years. However, we eventually believed her when we each, and every one of us, my sisters, all of us, saw the ghost of the eight-year-old boy. For a ghost, the little boy is so insanely cute. The first time I saw him, I was helping my mom do some work on the computer. We both saw him from the corner of our eyes. We got up and ran around the corner to the sitting room, and there he was, wearing a red baseball cap with a blue shirt and carrying a baseball bat. He smiled, walked around the other corner, and then was gone. About a year later, my sister called me screaming, saying a little boy is in the house carrying a bat. <laughs> she wanted to know if she should call the cops, and obviously I told her not to unless they could get rid of a ghost. <laughs> when I said that, my sister hung up, drove back to her apartment, and was never alone in our house again. After that, I would constantly see the little boy walking around our sitting room with his baseball bat. Oh. One time, after I drunkenly came home from the bar, I passed out on the couch in that same room and woke up around 3 or 4 a.m. to the sound of three very loud knocks coming from the window right above my head. Me, being the drunk person that I was, got up and looked out the window to see if anyone was there. There was nothing. I shrugged it off and went back to sleep on the couch, thinking it was all in my head. Then, not five minutes later, three more louder knocks came from that same window. This time, I was obviously freaked out, so I turned on the lights, looked out the window, went around the corner to look out the door to see if someone was messing with me, but again, no one. So my 21-year-old self went upstairs into my parents' room. Don't forget, I'm super drunk. And tell my parents I have to sleep with them and tell my parents I have to sleep with them because a ghost was after me. That did not go well. And I ended up sleeping with my little sister in her twin bed. To this day, I have no clue if the knocking came from the little boy. But after that, I never saw his ghost again. Oh, and remember that old lady that used to live in the house till the 90s? Well, she died in 2002 in a nursing home and now hangs out in our basement and can be seen wearing all pink. She likes to say hi to my mom while she does the laundry. But the once she scared lady. the live the pink lady. pink lady. But once she scared the living hell out of my oldest sister by standing behind her while she was doing laundry. My sister said that the lady looked up at her with a foul look on her face. My sister thought she was going to get bitch slapped by a ghost and just left all her dirty laundry in the machine for me to do later. Honestly, the ghost should have bitch slapped her in my opinion. <laughs> My parents still live in that house, and every once in a while, my mom will call to tell me whenever something paranormal happens to her or in the house. My dad is still a non-believer, but my mom thinks he's just too scared to admit that there are actually ghosts in the house. I am proud to say that I will forever believe in ghosts and the paranormal, and the number one lesson I have learned from growing up in a haunted house is that not all spirits are bad. I'm extremely grateful for how I grew up and wouldn't want to have grown up without all of those experiences. Thanks for reading, fellow ghost-loving gals. Best, Laura. Wow. Oh, I want to know what happened. Like, what was the the turning point for the boy to just suddenly decide that he was just going to always appear? I wonder if there was some other spirit that was, like, in the house that they weren't really aware of that maybe Mm. – influenced how often he appeared maybe he was more lonely so he wanted to like that spirit moved on and then he was like okay well maybe i should just spend more time with the living i guess yeah find some comfort somewhere but i do, I love, do love that, that he was he's just kind of like carrying chilling. his baseball bat he's just yeah like, do, do, do. he's just a little kid having fun carrying Aww. his favorite sport and toy and activity to do it's very sandlot to me yeah it is yeah. it is super sweet. I also love that she was drunk. I went to her parents' room and I was like, can I sleep in your room tonight? Because there is a ghost after me. And her parents are probably like, oh my God, I've no. never seen her so trashed. But really, she's like, <laughs> I truly just happen to have had a few drinks and also there is a ghost <laughs> after me. <laughs> I could picture you, Corinne, doing this. And I feel like correct me if I'm wrong, if you were to do like two truths and a lie, this would be a truth that 
was that you've done this in recent years? I slept in my parents' room because there was a ghost after me? Yeah. Or like you were scared at your house in Vermont and you went to go sleep with your parents. Oh, I 1000% have gone yeah. and gotten my mom in the past yeah. year. No, oh, well, I don't that's... go into their bed. I, I go and get my mom and she has to come into mine. And she sleeps with you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's better. She has to come to my childhood bedroom and sleep <laughs> with me. And then we both hate it because we don't sleep well, like in the same no. bed as each other. But but otherwise, yeah, it's course. like, there's a ghost after me. What are you going to do? You're my mom. You have to come sleep in my bed. Yes. Even I'm almost 30 years old. So Yes. Sometimes Mr. Piggy doesn't protect me as much as I feel like no. you normally can. So Sometimes you need, to you need bring Mr. Piggy and the mom because that's yeah. strong reinforcements. Reinforcements. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. I knew or assumed that you were going to be a little old timey with the ghosts mm. that haunt your listener tale. And so yeah. I decided to go with someone who was a little bit more skeptical. Okay. And read. Well, that's kind of good. We both stuck to what we did for our topics. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Two topics in one. Yeah. This is titled, It's Not Me, It's You. So I was like, oh, <laughs> shit. <laughs> okay. Excited for uh, to see where this goes. I know. Ladies, must I say, much like many of your beloved or sorry, must I say, much like many listeners of your beloved podcast, I love it. My name mm-hmm. is JJ, she, they pronouns, and I found you guys sometime in November of 2021. I'm only 20, but I've been interested in the paranormal since as long as I can remember. However, as much as I have believed, I've also been somewhat of a skeptic. I've listened to your podcast religiously since I first heard it and remember countless stories of your listeners claiming to be haunted by the many spirits that your show attracts. I was kind of skeptical that just listening could attract paranormal activity (laughs) until earlier this week. Oh my gosh. I've always had trouble sleeping the older that I've gotten. It's something that I've just become accustomed to. But when you have a dog who claims half of the small twin size bed, (laughs) there's a lot more shuffling than normal. I had woken up for absolutely no reason, and I was facing the wall that my bed is pushed up against. My dog, Luna, was staring, was starting to shift, and I looked towards her to try to guess where she wanted to move to. Mind you, I was still half asleep, and my eyes were barely open, more like a tired squint. It was when I shuffled to sleep on my left side that I saw it, standing there at the end of my bed. It was me. Except there seemed to be a void in its eyes. And I distinctly remember my favorite tie-dye t-shirt on its body. (laughs) At the time, I didn't think much of it. I just covered my face with my blanket and I got comfortable in bed until my mind processed what I just saw. I maneuvered my wrist to light up so that I could read the time. 3.19 a.m. I did not get much sleep after that and was just patiently going in and out of consciousness. Later that day, I told my coworker who (gasps) is into cleansing and she shared her own stories with me. I left work early that day and I hauled my ass to the nearest church. I got a bottle of holy water. I blessed my room and my house, (laughs) but I still feel hesitant before I knock out at night. I just hope the nightlight I ordered gets here soon enough. (laughs) As much as I love you, ladies, I will be taking a short break from the pod- podcast because I am a damn little scaredy cat. <laughs> Thank you for all you do and for being the light in the world. I will also attach a photo of my puppy to make this a little bit happier. See you on the other side, JJ. Here's the puppy. Oh, okay. I have a brilliant business idea for us, Corinne. Oh, okay. Hold on. Let me get my notes. Because I've started to actually write them down so that we don't forget. What is the business idea, Sabrina? A TGOG nightlight that is this ghost. Oh, oh, Sabrina, that's so cute. TM, we're doing it. We're doing it. (laughs) I love that. I love that. A ghost nightlight to help keep away the ghosts. It's happening. It's happening. Because then all the ghosts will see the ghost nightlight and they're like, oh, there's a ready ghost here. The, it's, ghost they're, nightlight. They're busy. It's in our, it's in our thing. Okay. It's JJ, you now. inspired this. Okay. Wow. But this story also made me think and wonder how many times, okay, what if like, how do I write this? 
I'm curious how often we are sleeping and a weird, terrifying doppelganger version of us is just standing watching our, us watching and you sleep us, through it. Plotting, figuring out how to take our lives over without anyone knowing yeah. that it's them. They're like studying us and our behavior and how we sleep and what we do and the dog. Yeah. And like, yeah, maybe it was like trying to build the relationship with the dog too so that it, the dog was friendly with them so that they other people would think that there was nothing off. I do not <laughs> ah. like that. The void eyes. Ew, just standing there and – Wearing the favorite shirt? Yes, in their shirt, in their favorite tie day tee. Oh, it's so it. disturbing. That's like a doppelganger so example that I – Yeah, that I've never really – I don't think we've heard anything like this. It's really scary to think that it's just like your doppelganger is standing there at the end of your bed, just like waiting and watching. But you know what? It teaches Blankly. our listeners to believe us and everyone else when we say this podcast is haunted. This because podcast if is you the most question haunted. it, perhaps that's when you'll be from skeptic to believer real quick. Real quick. Because the ghosts are coming for you. <laughs> just say whether you, believe you want it or not. Say yeah. you believe it because then there's a better chance that the spirits won't haunt you, I think. Correct. I think so too. Yeah. Wow. Well, this has been fun. This is, I mean, what is it not fun? I know. This is a blast. Our favorite time of the week. Favorite time. If you have stories, please email them to us at twogirls1ghostpodcast at gmail.com. You can support us. You know the spiel. Rate and review on iTunes. We've got Patreon. we got merch. Join the TGO Triangle. Get lost in it. Uh, and then also, the please come to our our show. Come. Yes. July 21st, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. Corinne and I will be live streaming. So you can join from anywhere in the world, which is amazing. And Corinne and I will be together in Los Angeles and we'll be broadcasting mm -hmm. to the universe. Kind of like they our did when they had a experience. seance with Houdini. Exactly. Um, yeah. So please join Get us. your merch. Get into your yeah. comfiest campfire campy summer camp mm -hmm. vibes and clothes and join us then i'll wear my bucket hat perfect well now my hair is up so i can't yeah um and what's our new thank sign you. off it's it's uh oh go ahead well thank you to aiden manning and eric foster and the entire team at upfire digital for editing our podcast both video and audio please watch us on youtube subscribe like comment below tell us what our call signal should be on from the other side. We may or may not use them, but we want to hear what you would use yes. and what we should use. And um, we our new hope call to see sign. you. Yes, we hope to see you on this side. But if we don't, we will. We will see you, see you on, on the, the other, other side. side.